Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Robin Walker, and I am the program director. Today, we are fortunate enough to have three clinical experts presenting on stereotactic radiosurgery, evidence and experience with surface guidance radiation therapy. If you are with CAMPEP and MDCB, please remember to take the quiz at the very end. There is a required pass rate of 8 out of 10 to receive your credit. There will be a live chat box on screen during this webinar. Please feel free to ask questions with the presenters during their presentations. This is live and interactive. First, I would like to introduce Josh Yamada, radiation oncologist from Memorial Sloan Kettering. He will be speaking on the clinical rationale for surface guidance with SRS. Well, welcome. I'm Josh Yamada. I'm a radiation oncologist in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and it's my honor and privilege to be part of this webinar. Uh, the task I have today is to discuss with you the clinical rationale for surface-guided radiation therapy for stereotactic radiosurgery. Here are my disclosures. One of the biggest paradigm shifts in the field of brain radiosurgery, I think, has been the move towards treating multiple brain metastases of radiosurgery and emitting whole brain radiation. There are a number of rationale for this, including better tumor control, the ability of focal radiation to spare the uninvolved brain and therefore less toxicity from radiation therapy. But a, prime, a big driver of this has been improvements in modern techniques in both treatment planning and delivery and uh, resource utilization for treating multiple metastases. Concerns about omitting whole brain radiation, including the risk of unseen micrometastases, as well as the toxicity of, for example, radionecrosis with radiation, with radiosurgery, uh, as well as resource allocation concerns. And these certainly were concerns for our, for our department as we moved away from whole brain radiation for the treatment of multiple brain metastases. I'm going to quickly just show you some uh, dose distributions of a six lesion case that was treated with radiosurgery. And I've set the isodose line for the blue uh, area as 300 centigrade, which would be equivalent to a typical single fraction of whole brain radiation. And you can see that although these lesions are treated in their entirety, the amount of radiation the whole brain receives for even a single fraction of uh, whole brain radiation would be significantly less when we use radiosurgical techniques. Much of the brain is spared uh, even 300 centigrade even though multiple brain lesions are treated in a single session. This dose volume histogram shows that the whole brain dose is 15 percent at 300 centigrade compared to of course 100 percent that would be uh, uh, found for whole brain radiotherapy. So as uh, my colleagues have already uh, discussed, there's really no loss of overall survival by uh, omitting whole brain radiation. Because there's significantly less dose delivered to the brain with radiosurgery, there's less toxicity, including less negative impact on neurocognitive decline. And there's no significant difference oncologically in outcomes when we're thinking about treating more than one brain metastasis. This is both in terms of overall survival, but also in terms of the risk of new brain metastases or the risk of developing leptomeningeal disease. And it's uh, really the development of new technologies in terms of uh, treatment planning and treatment delivery and that makes the uh, paradigm of treating multiple brain metastases of radiosurgery, particularly on LINAC-based system, both feasible and practical. For example, Astro came out several years ago with a statement in their Choosing Wisely series that suggests that perhaps when thinking about treating multiple brain metastases, we no longer need to go to an automatic knee-jerk reaction of recommending whole brain radiotherapy and that uh, focal radiation strategies may also be appropriate for these patients. There have been some technical uh, limitations that I think have uh, now been overcome so that the uh, technology has caught up with the oncology. For example, single or limited isocenter plans for treating multiple brain metastases and uh, the ability to reduce the treatment time has been a significant improvement uh, in, uh, in considering treatment for these patients. 
rapid optimized treatment planning has also been a big advance that really makes this type of approach much more feasible rather than the old days where we would plan uh, lesions and treat lesions one by one. These kinds of technologies have really made uh, the use of frameless systems uh, much more feasible and the image guidance aspect and the, that both for setup and verification and treatment delivery has really allowed uh, these types of treatment paradigms to come to the forefront. And in particular, I think that accurate monitoring these patients with surface guided technology has really been the glue that has brought all these pieces together to make this type of treatment uh, something that can be done uh, without a minimum of, with really just a minimum of fuss in the clinic. Single isocenter VMAT has uh, been a really big contribution to the workflow for this. Uh, and we're now able to treat multiple brain metastases in almost the same time it takes to treat a single, set, sing, uh, single lesion. This is an interesting paper from uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, written by uh, Evan Thomas, that shows that for comparable uh, uh, gamma knife plans, there's significant time savings, particularly in the treatment time with VMAT uh, single isocenter arc therapy. Looking at plan quality, whether it's at the lower dose paradigms or, or in the higher dose domains, there's no significant difference in the plan quality for multiple brain metastases when comparing single isocenter VMAT plans with gamma knife plans. And in terms of the mean dose, again, no significant difference between gamma knife or multi-arc uh, VMAT plans, suggesting that well-planned patients will do equally well. There are, of course, some anatomic limitations to frame placement. These could be iatrogenic uh, uh, challenges, such as the placement of burr holes or uh, loss of bone from skull flap uh, concerns, a large calvarium, uh, ankylosing neck, or a short neck, for t particularly patients who've been on steroids for a long time, are challenging in terms of positioning the frame adequately, particularly for low uh, uh, lying lesions in the brain. Some questions we've had are, uh, you know, how good is frameless immobilization? Uh, because there are obvious advantages to going away from the frame. But also, an initial question we asked is, how good is frame-based immobilization? We've always assumed that frame-based immobilization provides perfect uh, immobilization. And uh, for many years, uh, stereotactic radiosurgery was done with that assumption. However, with uh, image guidance, we can now actually verify whether even frame-based systems are providing the degree of stability that has often been assumed. So we did a simple little study looking at patients who were being treated for, uh, with a frame-based approach and did cone beam imaging them of them at the time of treatment to see if there are any changes from the original uh, simulation CT positioning and the positioning noted at the time of treatment in the same patients in the same day of treatment. So here, for example, is the comb beam CT with the uh, uh, fiduciary uh, localization rods in place, and we're very helpful for comparing the uh, reference image, the simulation CT, with the treatment image the comb beam CT. So if we try to match the uh, fiduciary rods, you can see that the anatomy shifts. Or if we try to match the anatomy, you can see that the, uh, fiduciary, the, the fiduciaries will actually shift. And this suggests that there actually is movement in the patient from the time of simulation earlier that morning to the time of treatment uh, later that day. Those changes, fortunately, are small, but when you're treating small lesions, even small changes can be clinically significant. But this type of data uh, made us uh, realize that even frame-based systems do sh have a small degree of uh, setup and motion uncertainty. Therefore, going to image guidance where we can use uh, that system for correction of errors rather than completely depending upon measurements 
seem to us a logical uh, way to uh, approach patients and that there was a rationale for moving to a frameless uh, uh, a treatment platform. The skull is an excellent fiduciary and is easily imaged and can be easily matched and uh, uh, both rotational and translational errors can be calculated quickly and uh, comb beam imaging was uh, very well suited uh, for this type of approach. It's a 3D data set, and here you can see that uh, we can uh, and visually verify that the uh, positioning is perfect. Another question, however, is that once you get the patient into the right position, how can you confirm that the patient stays in the correct position for actual treatment? This is a paper that we published a number of years ago looking at our initial experience of using 3D surface mapping as the way to monitor patients for actual treatment. Uh, we found that this is a very robust system with accuracy both for uh, uh, translational errors less than a tenth of a millimeter and rotational errors could be detected to less than a tenth of a degree of rotation and that this can be done in real time and also important is the fact that it's an independent way to monitor patient position and uh, any potential movement during the actual delivery of radiation. And this can be done at multiple couch angles uh, and is therefore helpful, uh, in particularly in, in the management and treatment of cranial lesions. Uh, we did a small study using this surface mapping system to look at the degree of both rotational and translational changes of the same patient, both in the frameless uh, treatment position and the frame patient. So these patients were actually treated uh, with a frame-based system and they're also immobilized in a frameless system. And we can see that uh, the same pattern of rotational and translational errors exist independent of the uh, immobilization system. It's really more dependent upon the patient themselves rather than whether they were in a frame-based or frameless uh, immobilization system in terms of the amount of errors that we saw over time. Uh, for example, uh, both the frame-based and frameless systems provided the same degree of rotational and translational changes. Uh, the mean translational change uh, about a third of a millimeter uh, regardless of the immobilization uh, for a translation with a standard deviation of uh, uh, 0 0.2 millimeters and rotational changes of 0 0.2 degrees and a standard deviation of about 0 0.1 degree. So this suggests that uh, both systems are equally uh, capable of immobilizing the patient and keeping them in the correct position for treatment. What are the consequences of not picking up on these types of errors? Even if the errors are small, there can be clinically significant changes. For example, this is an example of two lesions, and I've added uh, contours for uh, both a one degree and two degree rotational error in the axial plane to the right. You can see that if there are significant changes in rotation that are not picked up and corrected, you could actually miss the target particularly for small lesions. And imagine that this error could be magnified if you're treating multiple metastases. In the sagittal uh, nod, uh, which I think is the most commonly seen uh, positional change, uh, uh, again, this is just an example of what happens if there's a slight rotational change. And this table shows that you go from half a degree of rotation to two and a half degrees of rotation. The further away from the isocenter the target is, the more significant the displacement. And so, of course, for small lesions, uh, a four millimeter displacement would be an outright miss. So at our institution, we have currently moved completely to a frameless system. Uh, we use it both for hypofractionation and single session radiosurgery. Uh, VMAT isocentric treatment planning, no, usually no more than two isocenters even for a multiple brain metastases is necessary. We use a 66 six, uh, deg uh, degree freedom of couch, uh, which I think is very helpful for treating these patients and setting them up quickly. And again, we depend upon 3D surface mapping to tell us 
First of all, when we set up the patient, the patient set up properly actually saves us a comb beam scan when we set the patients up with uh, surface mapping. And then an independent, uh, robust, real-time motion monitoring uh, uh, is necessary during actual treatment. And that, again, is the 3D surface mapping that provides that. Hypofractionation in particular is uh, uh, really an advantage of the frameless approach. Uh, for example, in re-irradiation settings or when we're treating near eloquent areas that might receive significant dose, such as the optic apparatus, the brainstem, or the motor strip. This is interesting data from an Italian group uh, where they looked at the outcomes between single session radiosurgery and hypofractionation for large uh, tumors with greater than two centimeters in diameter. And they treated uh, 151 in single session radio surgery and 138 patients with hypofractionation, hypofractionation using a nine gray times three paradigm. They found no difference in plan quality in terms of conform uh, conformity index, no differences in tumor size or in patient characteristics such as KPS. What they did find, however, is that there was a significant a reduction in local control probability when using single session radio surgery for large lesions. Overall, the local control with single session radio surgery was only 77% versus 90% for hypofractionation uh, at 9 gray times 3. And in particular, very large lesions beyond 3 centimeters in diameter showed the biggest differences 54% local control of single session radio surgery compared to 73% with hypofractionation. Equally important is that the risk of radionecrosis is significantly reduced when going to a hypofractionated paradigm for larger lesions. Overall, a 20% rate of radionecrosis is noted in single session radio surgery compared to only 8% with multifraction hypofractionated treatment. And again, when you look at large lesions greater than 3 centimeters in diameter, a 33% rate of radionecrosis for single session radio surgery compared to only 14% with hypofractionation. This kind of data suggests that uh, hypofractionation may be a better paradigm for, single uh, for large lesions compared to single session radio surgery. And uh, in this uh, context, of course, frameless treatments uh, paradigms are going to be a much more practical way to ac accomplish this. So in summary, I think there is a strong oncologic rationale to consider radiosurgery for multiple metastases even beyond uh, four lesions because there is no uh, loss in overall survival. There's less dose to the brain and less toxicity, including sparing neurocognitive functioning, and that there's no significant difference in other oncologic outcomes, such as the risk of developing new metastasis in the brain or leptomeningeal disease when you move beyond a single uh, solitary metastasis. Hypofractionation, I think, is becoming much more feasible now with frameless techniques and image guidance, and particularly for large lesions may be advantageous, both in terms of local control and reducing the risk of radionecrosis. So it's really the combination of a single isocenter or um, uh, uh, limited isocenter VMAT-based treatment planning and delivery married the 3D image guidance that makes this paradigm feasible. The 3D image guidance is really two parts. It's comb beam CT scanning, uh, and uh, in combination with that, real-time 3D surface uh, mapping to monitor patient position as well as setting up the patient properly that allows this paradigm to work so well. It allows us to achieve rapid planning as well as delivery of patients, uh, which really makes this uh, entire paradigm quite feasible in the clinic. The image guidance provides the accuracy at least equal to frame-based treatments and the independent real-time monitoring for any positional errors that the 3D surface mapping provides is key. And all of this together really uh, makes uh, it feasible to treat multiple metastases without any kind of a drain on department resources. And thank you for your attention. Next, I would like to introduce Grace Kim, physicist from UCSD Radiation Oncology. She will be presenting on her eight years of experience with surface guidance in stereotactic radiosurgery. 
Hello, my name is Grace Kim. I'm here today to share my experience of the radio surgery with the image service guided. Our department has implemented this technique since 2009, treating three to four patients on a daily basis. Currently, UC San Diego has four radiation treatment clinics. The main clinic is located in La Jolla, while the remaining three satellites are located in North Coastal, North Inland, and South Bay. Three of these clinics use a surface image-guided system for radiosurgery, DIVH, sarcoma, extremity, and SBRT cases. The department developed standard operating procedures in order to implement the surface image-guided technique. The AAPM Task Group 147 report QA for non-radiographic radiotherapy localization and positioning system will be a good guideline to establish individual procedures. Six clinical steps can be involved in surface image-guided radiosurgery. In the CT simulation step, therapists create the open mask with a customized headrest and occasionally screened out if the patient is not a good candidate for this technique. During the uh, planning system, the isocenter position and couch rotation is uh, decided and the reference surface is created from the body contour. In the line system, surface image is registered for the initial setup and monitoring. Optimal selection of region of interest is crucial for accurate monitoring. The last three steps, initial setup, capture new reference image, and the treatment will be explained in later slides. We use TrueBeam with the Eclipse version 15 and the AlignRT system for radio surgery procedures. The head adjuster can be used for 4D IGRT couch and we are in the process of installing the 60 couch with the hyper arc function. Additionally, in SRS calibration, QA cube is provided for the ice center calibration as a part of the aligner TSRS module. The Winston Lutz test with the gantry couch combination is required for the SRS QA process. For the CT simulation, the SRS open mask secure the forehead and the chin area while laterally exposing the face area before the hairline. Thin slice size is important for accurate calculation as well as the positioning of the patient with the comb beam image. Usually less than 1.5 millimeter is recommended. During imaging for target delineation, high-resolution T1 post-contrast is the primary image sequence for the metastasis. Also, T2 flare sequence provides peritumoral edema information. If there isn't appropriate or most up-to-date MR sequence, then the high-resolution CT with the contrast can be used for target delineation. For the ABM cases, CPA or MRA is required for contouring the nidus, while the Fiesta image sequence is required for trisaminal neuralgia, providing the superior image quality. While planning procedure, smooth body contour without the strong artifacts are required for creating the optimal surface sur uh, reference surface. In our clinic, CT ISO is placed at the middle line of the brain, brainstem level, and the usual origin is placed at the bridge of the nose. So there is no tattoo or BB on the mask. Shift information to the ice center will be provided in the setup note. The default plan template starts from three arcs, depends on the location of the target, and as on one more arc, in case the plan needs to be improved. Beam arrangement can be varied for multi-metastasis or the uh, multi-isocenter plans in one course treatment. For the initial setup, two therapists cooperate for the rotation and translational adjustments. 
The pre-combium goal is to be less than 0.5 mm in translational direction and less than 0.5 degree in rotational axis from the reference surface. If allow a large deviation of the rotation, it can cause a restart from the initial setup for maxed out gauge. In case you don't have a 60 couch function, you can start KBKB match to correct gross rotational errors. Then the patient will be placed at the final treatment position with the Combin 3D 3D match. The new reference image is captured in LINRT after the couch shift applied. At this point, the gantry should be either 0 or 180 degree with a retracted KB source and imager. Occasionally, monitoring deltas can disappear for a split second and reappear wire KB imaging for insufficient sur surface overlap. However, delta values are always available for their treatment, even if one of the camera is uh, obstructed by the gantry. Once a couch rotation angle is selected in a line RT application, according to the plan couch angle, reference surface will be rotated to the target position. Throughout this rotation, all delta value will be provided continuously. Daily QA is required before any surface image guided treatment. This QA is basically make sure that the camera calibration is valid and there is no change of the correlation of the parts. The current tolerance of the root mean square error is less than one millimeter. In case of daily QA fails, the monthly QA should be implemented to pass the daily QA. Monthly QA, otherwise known as a camera calibration, is performed either when daily QA is failed or after major events like camera positioning change, Linux ISO changes, and the system upgrade. Place the uh, calibration board at SSD 100 cm with the front pointer and crosshair, so make sure turn off and light field and adjust room light, same as the treatment luminosity. Race calibration technique will improve the accuracy of the monitoring when ISO is placed posteriorly. Once the monthly QA is complete, the ISO center calibration can be used for uh, fine tuning the ISO center of the alignment camera with the MV treatment beam ISO center. Five ceramic fiducials in the Phantom will provide 6D calibration information. The treatment ma machine acquires four MV orthogonal images and processes them in the ISO center calibration module. The radiographic analysis will provide the fine tuning of the monthly calibration. So far, we have been talking about the QA items from the vendor. But now we would like to, I would like to briefly discuss the customized QA. In our department, daily integrated IGRT QA has been designed to start from surface imaging and MV, KB, couch motion, and comb beam. And finally, the finish the uh, surface image to close the loop of the QA. The therapist should align the phantom with the laser, then set up with aligner T to fine tuning to six delta value close to zero. Then a uh, therapist should start MV imaging, check the uh, electronic reticules, and record deviations if there is any. Implement the 2D 2D match acquired orthogonal KV images with the DRRs which generate from the plan has a one centimeter shift in all directions. Then apply the shift, then do comb beam and check the registration with the 3D 3D match and record deviation if there is any. As a small tip, this IGRT QA is recommended to perform in file mode rather than RNV mode on true beam. This kind of bulky test patient potentially causes serious citrix traffic issue on ARIA 13 and above. Lastly, 
align our T-delta values are recorded to complete the loop of the IGRTQA, which have to match 10 millimeter made within tolerance range. Traditionally, the Winston loss test focused on the mechanical isocenter, but here, the monthly integrated IGRTQA combined different imaging modality into Winston loss test. The current SRS procedure is heavily involved with the KB comb beam image and the surface image as a primary positioning and monitoring technique. This QA box includes a 5 mm tungsten ball to represent the isocenter and face cover for surface monitoring. So we can test a line RT at the same angle of gantry and couch for the Winston loss test. Eight MV port images with a different combination of gantry and couch will complete the Winston loss report. It depends on treatment beam defining device. Right upper images are 2x2 two two MRC defined fields, and the lower images are 1.75 cone defined fields. As a part of commissioning or annual QA, the signal stability of Per gantry rotation is re recommended to be checked. Variation of delta value during the gantry rotation was within plus minus 0.2 millimeter and plus minus 0.2 degree. For the couch walk test, surface image has been tracked for minus 90 to 90 degree. And variation of delta values during couch rotation was plus minus 0.3 millimeter and 0.3 degrees. For few further information, UC San Diego published the clinical outcome studies of the surface image guided radio surgery for multiple intracranial metastasis, the trigeminal neuralgia, and the benign skull based tumors. In terms of a risk assessment, surface image guided radio surgery has been investigated using. FMEA, FTA, and healthcare FMEA, and the system and control theory based hazard analysis. These studies are published in medical physics. Additionally, some researches for the technical aspects has been published. For example, prospective treatment plan specific action limit for real time monitoring in surface image guided radio therapy and evaluation of the isocenter calibration method. It's time to bring this presentation to a close. Thank you for your time and cooperation. Lastly, I would like to introduce Josh Lawson, radiation oncologist from Lexington Medical Center. He will be presenting on the role of surface guidance in SRS. Thank you. I'm Joshua Lawson. I'm from West Columbia, South Carolina at Lexington Medical Center, and I'm going to speak today on the role of surface image guidance uh, in SRS and SBRT. I don't have any financial disclosures, no honoraria, no grants, nothing. On the outline of the presentation, I'll start with brain radio surgery, though I know Dr. Yamada covered that in a bit more extensive detail, and the evolution of technologies in my own practice from a frame-based solution to the initial go at frameless uh, radio surgery with the optical array, and then the current utilization of surface imaging, and then branch into body where the uh, flow of technologies was essentially the same. So the gold standard radio surgery machine remains the gamma knife, the earliest first machine. This is a frame-based solution. This and other frame-based approaches require rigid immobilization, which is the uh, fixation of a rigid head frame to patients. Dr. Yamada covered some of the limitations of this, uh, which I'll review again. It is uncomfortable. It doesn't guarantee that the patients will not move, though they typically don't, but Dr. Yamada showed one instance when that can happen. Uh, it's not very practical for fractionated treatments, though it can be done, and it's appropriate Linac or Gamma Knife, either one of them can be done with a frame-based solution. So our initial approach at frameless radio surgery at UCSD was to employ the thermoplastic mask with the bite block and the optical array of reflective markers tracked in the room. This was still uncomfortable with the dental mold, but less so than a rigid head frame. The big gain was that it allowed flexibility for simulation and treatment to be done on different days and also allowed uh, for fractionated treatment to be done a bit more feasibly. This is an example of that frameless array system in the green at the bottom right is an example of dental mold for a patient and then in-room tracking shown by the red arrows. A system of cameras tracks not the patient but these reflective markers which are attached to a lattice which is affixed to the dental mold. 
When we began using this system in about 2007, uh, we tracked our outcomes and found that patients had very good actuarial local control, 76% at 12 months, with crude local control at 88%. This is for all comers with brain metastases. Shown on right is the impact of tumor size. Of course, larger size tumors are more are less likely, rather, to be controlled long term. And this controlled rate compared very favorably to those of other reported series, both frame-based and frameless, as shown in the red here, with our crude local control at 88%. The crude number is shown there because the other series reported crude numbers. So we felt like we were able to abandon the frame and not sacrifice precision nor accuracy. There were some disadvantages to the frameless system that we were using at the time, most notably that it relies on the assumption that a patient is reproducibly able to bite the bite block. It also relies on good dentition, and so a certain number of patients are not great candidates. But the reproducibility, reproducibility of the bite is not always a guarantee. And as Dr. Yamada said, likely the best fiducial marker is the patient's skull rather than some external marker. So at that point, we began to investigate the utilization of surface imaging with the Vision RT system from Align RT. This is non-invasive, non-ionizing, uses a system of in-room cam cameras to image the surface of the patient. So of course, not imaging the tumor within, but imaging the surface of the patient. And that was an old camera. That's a picture of what our new cameras look like today. Motion is extracted by a comparison of a real-time image to an acquired reference image. That reference image can be from CT scan body contours, it can be from another AlignRT system in the simulation room, or it can be from an image acquired previously on that AlignRT system in the treatment room, like from the previous session or earlier in that treatment session, and then obtains point to surface distance between the reference image and the real-time generated surface with deltas displayed in six degrees of freedom as shown here schematically with the green being the surface of a patient and then the three cameras in the room continuously providing tracking of that patient's positioning over the course of treatment delivery. And this is just a screen capture of the, uh, of the screen that we see outside the room displaying the deltas in vertical lunge and lat as well as the rotation roll and pitch in real time in six degrees of freedom. So as we began to use that system or as we began to investigate using that system, we were currently using the optical array system that I described a moment ago and wanted to test the robustness of the AlignRT system itself. So as you can see in the picture, we attached the Rando Phantom as well as the SRS Phantom uh, from the ZMED system, uh, attached both of those to the treatment couch and then used both systems in the room, introduced known couch translations and measured the delta between the measured translations on each of the two systems. These are shown kind of a busy slide here. The first three columns are the actual known couch translations, vertical, longitudinal, and lateral. And then the second three columns, now outlined in red, show the difference in measurements between the two systems in vertical, longitudinal, and lateral. And you can see they're always less than a millimeter. So from that, we felt very comfortable that the Vision RT system, the Align RT system itself, was robust enough for utilization in a radiosurgical application. We then began to monitor some volunteers. We were really uh, had our heart set on calling this maskless because it we just liked the sound of it. And so we I had uh, monitors passively immobilized and healthy volunteers, these were physicists largely, and we had them lie down on the treatment table for 20 minutes and monitor them continuously. And you can see on, these are just traces for volunteers one and three, that over time, out to about 20 minutes, the patients are really quite stable. There is a bit of drift, but on the translations, this is always less than half a millimeter. And in the rotations, also always less than a half a degree, even in the top right, that one spike that settled down with time, and even at that point only approached one half of one degree, and that was sort of an outlier measurement. So we felt like patients were able to reliably and comfortably lie still for about 20 minutes over the duration of treatment. We did have to modify our maskless approach. Shown on left there was the initial passive mold that we used. It just turned out to be too cumbersome to make and too uh, time intensive and too difficult. So we did give a little on the definition of maskless and go now with an open-faced mask, which is a minimally active immobilization and use that uh, currently and have at UCSD hundreds and hundreds of patients treated. In my current clinic, we've also treated several hundred patients. So the general workflow for uh, SGRT, and this is specifically the brain radiosurgery application for now, patients are simulated like normal. At that time, they have created their plastic mask, which I'll show in a moment, treatment planning as normal, export the plan and the structures from the treatment planning system, import isocenter and structures into AlignRT. Then at treatment, we use the CT body contour as the reference image and use the Vision RT system for initial positioning of patients. We step out of the room, then perform KV, OBI, and cone beam CT imaging and finalize, fine tune uh, patient positioning, verifying appropriateness of positioning, and then acquire a new Vision RT reference image that's used for monitoring during treatment delivery. So we treat, monitor, and adjust the patients if needed. 
our approach, which is similar, I think, to Dr. Yamato described, we try to use single fraction radio surgery if possible. Patients with a single less than two centimeter metastasis typically get 21 gray times one. People with one to three, sometimes more, as Dr. Yamato also showed, uh, but all, if all small, we'll still treat these people with a single fraction, 18 gray to 21 gray times one. If they have just too many uh, or they're bigger, then we do hypofractionate and give typically nine gray times three, nine or 10. And we treat patients less than one week from simulation, try to do it just two days but from CT simulation. They do undergo a planning MRI in the mask on the day of the treatment. Sometimes it's the day before, but we try to have that done right before treatment is delivered. We try to use two arcs and infrequently use table kicks in order to improve the efficiency of treatment delivery, knowing that patients are good for about 20 minutes, and we'd like to get this done in under. So this is just an example patient. She has non-small cell lung cancer. At presentation, she had a solitary metastatic deposit and a right lung mass with erosion of her chest wall. So if he, she got single fraction radio surgery to that, which I won't show, and then got chemotherapy and a short course consolidative thoracic radiation on short on interval rather MRI about four or so months later following treatment. She developed these two new brain metastases shown on this MRI. I met with her and discussed again op options including whole brain radiation versus additional radio surgery. But as long as patients have small volume disease progression, we try to continue on the radio surgical path. So she elected to proceed with single fraction radio surgery, and we did this all in one day because she lives quite a ways away. So she came to the clinic uh, relatively early in the morning. Here's Reagan and Sarah making her plastic mask. They stretch the mask over her face, cool it with the rag and fan. We do attach BBs to the front and the sides. And then we CT with 1.25 millimeter slice thickness. We always CT through the upper shoulders just in case there are table kicks or any potential for gantry collision. We'd like to have the body contour at least that low so we can try to predict and avoid those collisions. So we use 1.25 millimeter thickness down through the shoulders. And then after her CT simulation, she goes to the MRI, which happens to be right across the uh, hall from the CT simulator, and has an MRI done in the treatment mask. There's lesion one, there's lesion two. There were no new lesions identified on this treatment planning MR, which was done really just a couple of days after her diagnostic MR. So then she went and had lunch with her daughter who lives here in town and watched a movie while we did her treatment planning. This is all in Eclipse. We add one millimeter to each of these lesions, and each of them was prescribed 21 gray. These were too far apart to be treated with single isocenter. We try to use single isocenter whenever possible, um, but for this case, it just was too far apart, too much normal brain in between. So she did get a two isocenter plan, treating them these singularly and sequentially. But here it is, 21 gray times one to each of them. Then she returned later in the afternoon. This is us in the treatment room. The mask is reattached, and she's on the table, and we're ready to begin. This is the in-room Vision RT system, which we use for initial positioning, seeing she's not in position yet. Now she is. Once she's in position, we step out of the room. There uh, she is lying on the table, pretty minimally immobilized with just a knee sponge and uh, continuously monitored by the Vision RT system. We then step out to the console, perform KV OBIs for confirmation, and then fine-tune her positioning with the cone beam CT shown here. Once her positioning was appropriate, we begin the treatment and monitor on this uh, screen, which is at the therapist station outside the room. And she was very stable throughout the treatment. You can see there, this is a report that we generated at the completion of treatment. She remained quite still throughout treatment. She was comfortable throughout. This took seven minutes, 43 seconds. That's per lesion. So it ended up about 15 to 20 minutes total. She came to the room at five and she was leaving at 5.30. We treated both of those lesions in, in single fraction treatment. And then she did very well. This is her most recent MRI. It's about two months following this treatment. There's just a wisp left of that metastasis and that metastasis as well, but essentially a complete radiographic response, and she's had no toxicity from this nor her previous radio surgery, so we wish the best for her, but should she develop limited volume brain disease again in the future, we would opt again with, to conti with a continuation of radio surgery as long as it's feasible. With the surface image guidance and with SGRT and radio surgical application, we track the outcomes for patients treated. This is also at UCSD. And again, found 12 month actuarial local control of 84%. If you'll reference back to the slide, so oh, with the table of outcomes, local control outcomes before, this is very much in line with outcomes with frame based solutions uh, and other frameless solutions. So we felt like this is, remains a very uh, viable approach in terms of the outcome of local control. We use the same system for the treatment of benign disease, benign skull-based tumors. This is a much smaller series, patients with meningioma, vestibular schwannoma, pituitary adenoma, followed for about 65 months with only one local failure, which would be in line with expectation and no grade three or greater toxicity. So we also use the same system for trigeminal neuralgia, though I don't have that series and those numbers remain quite small, but this is our radiosurgical system. I wanted to jump now to spine, which followed a fairly similar progression of technologies. When we began doing spine radiosurgery, the motivation really is 
how effective it is. And th there are a number of series. I just picked this one because at least at the time it was the largest. It probably still is. 500 cases from a single institution. And you can see that local control uh, and radiographic control as well as pain control approaches 90% within this series, no acute nor subacute spinal damage, and that's pretty commonly seen. Uh, spinal cord toxicity can happen, but it's thankfully quite rare, but the vast majority of the patients have a very good outcome in terms of radiographic control and pain control, so the motivation to do this is strong. As we started it, we didn't have rapid arc, didn't have flattening filter free, and didn't have vision RT. So the initial approach was that patients were receiving nine field static or nine static field IMRT treatment plans. We would set them up based on skin marks. Again, use OBI and cone beam CT for setup verification and fine adjusting. And then after every third beam, pause to re-image to verify continuation of positioning appropriateness. Uh, this drew out the treatment time somewhat, and you can see in this table the first two sets of columns, OBI number one and cone beam CT, are pre-treatment to uh, validate and verify appropriate positioning at initiation of treatment. And then OBI number two and OBI number three are the ones done after treatment fields three and six. We didn't do one after treatment nine. And most of the time, patients hadn't moved, but you can see in the, in the range, sometimes they had, and it was a bit disconcerting because you didn't know when had they moved, at what point after the, over the last three fields, at what point had they moved, and you didn't also know exactly what to do about it at that so that was not all that appealing. We wanted to improve the time taken to treat these patients by reducing that and also improve motion management by using intrafraction uh, monitoring with the Vision RT system. So one of the gains was by going from static field IMRT plans to rapid arc plans. You can see two side-by-side -side comparisons here. Visibly, the rapid arc plan looks better. It's a bit uh, lower in monitoring units, but here on the DVH, they have similar PUTV coverage and a, a bit better organ at risk sparing with the rapid arc plan. But the big gain with the jump from rapid arc to, or to rapid arc rather, from IMRT was in treatment time. This is a busy slide of 12 patients, but the real measure there, or the real take home is the treatment time with IMRS was about 20 minutes with the treatment time with rapid arc was able to be reduced to about eight minutes. And it really wasn't beam on time. It was avoiding the intrafraction re-imaging sessions after treatments three and six with motion management continuously with the Vision RT system. And then the next little game was to go from the conventional 6X beam to the flattening filter free beam. And here too, you can see the plans compare very similar visibly. They're, they're symmetrically not much different, but the flattening filter free beam can run at 1400 monitoring units per minute and is able to get these treatments done much quicker. So what we do at our institution is typically follow the RTOG protocol. We use 16 gray in a single fraction. I know from Dr. Yamada and he makes a very strong argument that that's probably not enough dose. We just haven't had the stomach to go up to 24 like he does, uh, but I do applaud him for that and do recognize the strength of his data supporting that. But we typically just follow the RTOG and treat patients less than a week from simulation. Again, two arcs, flattening filter free and no table kicks, all done to improve the efficiency of treatment and with continuous motion management intrafraction with the Vision RT system, which we also use for setup. So here's another example patient. She had T6 metastasis. This is another woman with lung cancer. She has also had brain radio surgery too, but I won't show that, but presented with a painful metastatic deposit at T6 and after discussion elected to proceed with single fraction treatment in an effort to palliate her pain. This is her treatment plan. It's again a rapid arc plan. Uh, with the flattening filter free, delivering 16 gray times one, and we again follow the RTOG constraints. At the time of treatment delivery, we do the KVOBIs for confirmation of positioning, fine tuning with cone beam CT, really looking at the interface of vertebral body and spinal canal, because of course the most feared toxicity of all these treatments is spinal cord toxicity, and so we really try to be sure that we're dead on at that interface and then deliver the treatment uh, relatively quickly with continuous monitoring with Vision RT. Her treatment time, I think it says about six minutes there, so it was really quite quick, and that's a lot of monitoring units, but she did very well with this treatment and continues to have good pain control. I don't have an image of her uh, post-op, but she did quite well. So the last little bit, I want to talk about lung SBRT. Um, here again, why would anyone want to do lung SBRT? Well, because it works and it's very well tolerated. There are a number of representative series. I just picked this RTOG 0236 from Dr. Timmerman to show. Uh, it's a fractionation that we don't use at our clinic, but I'll show why that may not really matter. Uh, 20 gray times three, so 60 gray in three fractions. These are all medically inoperable patients with early stage non-small cell lung cancers who got radio surgery, and it worked quite well. Local control 98%, no marginal recurrences, only a few regional failures, and also quite good tolerability as well. So here again, the motivation to do this is because it works. It's well tolerated, and it works. 
Uh, this is what I meant about the fractionation. Here's a table showing a number of different dose and fractionation schemes. They're sort of all over the place. But the last uh, one column in from the right, the local control column, you can see essentially independent of the dose and fractionation schedule used, the local control is always quite good, uh, approaching 90, 95%, and, uh, and never lower than about 80%. So with a number of different approaches, this remains quite an effective treatment approach. There have been two attempts at randomized controlled trials. Both of them closed early due to poor accrual. People don't like to be randomized between surgery and not surgery. But of course, this was operable patients, and they were randomized to lobectomy with mediastinal lymph node dissection versus SBRT. In total, it's only 58 patients. I know that's a shortcoming. It's a pooled results, two trials that each closed early due to poor accrual, but still, recurrence-free survival over the two trials pooled together was identical for surgery versus radio surgery. What was interesting to me is that overall survival actually favors radio surgery. Now again, I know it's low numbers and I'm not drawing any conclusive um, statements from this. However, it is at least thought-provoking that the SBRT arm had better survival than the surgery arm and the suggestion is that this is a difficult surgery and many of these patients, even if they're medically inoperable, are somewhat tenuous in their cardiopulmonary status and having a lobectomy with a mediastinal lymph node dissection is not a trivial surgery. That surgery may well exacerbate underlying cardiopulmonary conditions and contribute to an earlier death versus if they had had radio surgery instead without compromise in their recurrence-free survival. Of course, when we use uh, radio surgery in the lung, this brings up the real-life consideration of motion management. Obviously, people are breathing during treatment, and some of the lesions within the lungs are expected to display some motion with respiration, shown in this little animation here. So to deal with motion, there are a number of different solutions. Uh, 4D CT simulation, which allows the potential for gating or an ITV based on a NIP image, or breath hold, abdominal compression, or slow CT. What we've done at our clinic is 4D CT simulation, and typically either uh, an ITV based on a NIP or breath hold. Basically, our breakdown is we treat primary uh, early stage non-small cell lung cancer with 12 gray times 4, metastatic lesions 12 gray times 5. Uh, some of the exceptions, if the lesion is too big or we can't meet constraints on normal structures, hard esophagus, etc., then we slow that down and use 10 gray times 5, though we usually stick to 12. For upper lobe lesions, most of these patients can be treated with free breathing. Most of their lesions don't show a lot of respiratory motion, particularly the smaller ones, so we like to treat them based on an ITV created from their MIP imaging. Sometimes breath hold times three, as you get closer to the diaphragm, there's more respiratory motion, so most of these patients are treated with breath hold. And what we do at CT simulation is we do a 4D CT to evaluate for respiratory motion, but then if there is substantial motion, we have them do three breath hold scans, and we use all three of the breath hold scans to create sort of a Boolean GTV over three of those breath hold sessions. So here's another example patient. You can see uh, on his right, our left, that went by the green arrow, a small peripheral lung cancer. He was lucky enough to present with two lung cancers. He had a larger one in his left upper lobe uh, and some questionable mediastinal lymph nodes. So he went for mediastinal node dissection along with lobectomy of the left upper lobe. He had, was actually node negative but was stage 1B and did get some adjuvant chemotherapy to complete treatment of what, what his left upper lobe early lung cancer. At completion of that, he came back for radiosurgery for his contralateral and simultaneous early non-small cell lung cancer. So he uh, did show respiratory motion that was substantial at simulation. So this is a screenshot of Velocity. When they do the three breath holds, we take all three of those image sets, we send them to Velocity, and we create a GTV based on each of those individually, and then Boolean those together and expand for treatment planning. We do the treatment planning in Eclipse. Typically, our margins for treatment are 5 millimeter radially and 5 to 10 millimeters soup to nth, depending on size, respiratory motion, and reproducibility of the breath hold, since we have those three to evaluate for consistency in that. At the time of treatment delivery, we again perform KV-OBI for positioning verification. We also do cone beam CT. It usually takes two breath holds to get through the cone beam CT, so that too is sort of an aggregate over two breath holds to see reproducibility of the breath hold. After appropriateness of positioning is confirmed, we obtain a new reference surface image with the aligner T system by having the patients take yet another deep breath. Then we allow them to breathe for a minute, 30 seconds, however long until they're comfortable, and then you see Teresa outside here looking at the console, and the patient is out of tolerance now because he's free breathing. She says, take a deep breath in, blow it out, take a deep breath in, and hold it. And then there you see, she's happy because he's got all greens there. He's locked it in. That's just zoomed in here to show how he really did quite a good job of, of a reproducible breath hold. He holds his breath. We beam on. You can see there in the upper left, 
It's two arcs without table kicks. Each one of them ends up being about 1,500 monitor units per arc. So at 1,400 monitor units per minute, it's a little over a minute. Most people can't make it through a whole arc on one breath hold. He didn't. Uh, he asked for a breath hold halfway through, so he would get halfway through an arc. We pause, give him a second to catch his breath, have another breath hold and go again. So he gets through the whole thing with four breath holds with continuous monitoring, and the whole thing took about 11 minutes. He thought it was way easier than surgery, not surprising. And at his most recent CT scan, uh, there you can see he's got some volume loss from his left lobectomy. But in his right lung, there's some scar, but he has certainly no evidence of disease progression in the beginning of disease response. So this is not an academic center, and I know this is not a fully rigorous academic evaluation, but we did take a look at our community center results. We began a radio surgery program, both brain and body, in November of 2014. This was when we got our first true beam machine and also got Vision RT at the time. Since then, we've treated over 200 patients with brain and body radio surgery. Of those, there were 24 medically inoperable stage 1 non-small cell lung patients. All of them got 12 grade times 4, and we've got short follow-up. I recognize that as a shortcoming, but we haven't been doing it that long. That's just how long we can follow them. Uh, but our crew local control at 92%. I would say that's very much in line with the table I showed earlier and also in line with the RTOG experience, which was in super specialized academic centers. So I think this is easily extrapolatable to the community setting. And in conclusion, I think both brain and body radio surgery treatments are done effectively and safely with a frameless SGRT approach. It's comfortable for patients. It fits in very well with your treatment schedule. We're able to do these in 20 or 30 minute time slots. It doesn't, it's not overly burdensome on therapists or treatment machines. And SBRT in general is a very appealing treatment strategy for spine, lung, liver, and other body sites and, and brain. And uh, surface image guidance can really help streamline the approach, avoid a body frame, avoid a rigid head frame, and help keep patients and referring physicians and everybody happy. And in conclusion, I'd just like to thank you. Those are my four kids in our, we have this old GTO convertible they love, so they're all playing. Thanks. Thank you for taking the time to view our webinar on stereotactic radio surgery, evidence and experience with surface guided radiation therapy. Please remember to take the quiz at the end for your CE credits. If you have any questions, please feel free to log in to www.sgrt.org. Have a great day.